the youth, everyone. And see, say hello. So hello all, good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are, whatever hour it is. Uh, a few announcements before we start our session of today. First of all, as I'm sure you all are aware, we are ending our wonderful course, which I enjoyed so much. I'm so objective and I enjoyed it so much, but we are ending it next week. And therefore this week I will be sending you also this week and also next week, I will be sending you a feedback form in our email. So I'll share the screen, just a moment, I've lost you. I'll share the screen, uh, screen number two. Now you can see that there's a feedback. It's not too long, that's it. Two yes, no questions. Not yes, no, but you have to only choose and three questions where we, you, we want uh, to request that you share your thoughts. So please help us help you help our future um, courses and everyone who can, please take your five, five to 10 minutes and answer this feedback, please, if you can. So that's one thing that I'm, I will be sending today out and I will send it, resend it next week, but we will be really happy until the beginning of September to have the feedback so we can really uh, prepare, uh, A, learn from what we did and B, prepare the next, uh, the next course is of course better. Second thing has to do with the same issue on the other way, uh, from the other flip of the coin. We are ending this course, but we started, or we're already in the middle of planning our next course, course to be started on February, 2022. Next year's course will be on knowledge management advanced methodologies. If this year we spoke about technologies and specifically about AI and KM, we will speak about KM, about the advanced methodologies. You had, we, we ran a survey so you are uh, familiar with part of the um, uh, part of the uh, sessions that we are planning, you can see them now on the screen. So we have six themes, six sessions. In every session, we have uh, three to four lessons in most of them. So we will be really happy if you want to join us also next year. We are not rerunning this course again and again. Whoever wants to see the course will go to YouTube. We are going advancing to the next course. So this will start in February. And because we are wiser or we prepared ourselves in time this year, it will start in February and therefore it will end on February, March, April, May, June. It will end on June. So it will end before the big vacations, before summertime. Uh, the opening of the course for registration, will, uh, the registration will start only on September 1st. So we will be sending you out the mail, the brochure, the details where you can register. We will send it again next week. Uh, starting on September 1st, you can uh, register to the course. Uh, I will be managing it together with me will be Balaji Ayer and Rudolf de Souza from um, India both. Maybe there will be one more person. We're not, uh, it's not closed yet, but we will be three to four. Uh, and of course that everyone is more than happy, uh, more than welcomed to join us. Uh, any questions? Okay, so let us start with our session today. And our session has to do with has to do with has to do with human empowerment the human ai 1 million dollar question and the question that we are all asking ourselves again and again what will happen with our jobs once we have ai 
So I send you to read some materials, but before I start, I would like to have an open discussion and hear your thoughts. What will happen, not tomorrow morning, but within a year, two years, five years, 10 years, not 10 years, but let's say five years as a result of AI. What will happen to the human uh, part? What will happen to us? Will we lose our jobs? Will we not lose our jobs? What do you think? Yes, Kari. Well, we could go down several paths, but the one I'll discuss here is that um, we'll probably be doing less thinking for ourselves and rely more on the AI to do a lot of the thinking for us, especially when it comes down to decision making. So, um, so especially like within departments of agencies like the Department of Defense, where they're going to be heavily data driven. A lot of the decisions that they're going to be making is going to be based off the data and sensors that they have out in the field and everything. So we'll be, instead of doing more strategic thinking, I think we're going to be doing less thinking overall and end up kind of like the folks on the uh, big boy ship there on uh, Wally -E and just sit around and getting bigger and drinking our smoothies. Okay, so we will continue walking, less thinking. And yet we will be strategically thinking. Great. Who wants to add? Who wants to uh, share his or her thoughts? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, this is John. Um, uh, there's an interesting book called Story Thinking. Uh, the subtitle is uh, Transforming Organizations for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And I, uh, I think that um, the, way, the way that uh, I wrote that book is looking at the mental model that, um, that, the, that the working class adopted after the second industrial revolution. As we looked at a factory uh, with input process and output, that became our thinking. We adopted that as our mental model. And uh, as we move to the fourth industrial revolution where there's, uh, there's more AI and robotics, uh, I, I believe that, um, that we need to adopt a different mental model and that is of story. And I see that the story in general is a is a category of courses that you've got um, Moria uh, listed for next year, which is fabulous. And I think that needs to happen. Uh, I also think that that um, that we've somewhat become um, le less of thinkers with the mental model that we've adopted. And uh, there's an opportunity to become more wholly human again as thinkers and strategists, uh, and uh, and let the routine tasks be given back. Uh, to uh, robotics and uh, the, the era of humans as robots uh, will finally be over. Okay, so we have two opinions that do not really contradict each other, but are different because John is speaking about uh, th more thinking and less routine doing. And uh, Corey was speaking about less thinking yet strategic, uh, strategic th uh, thinking. Hey, Maria, Any other? We another, yeah, we have yes. another one. Amanda has her hand up. Yes, Amanda, please. Thank you. And uh -huh. I, I agree with both of those things. And I think as the jobs are working, I think some people will have different jobs. Some people will have no jobs. But I think my concern is that we will see um, a, a, a widening of the digital divide or the inequity or all of those things that we have in the world. I think that um, there is a risk that we're going to widen a divide that we will end up with haves and haves nots in whatever way or lens you want to look at it um, in the world. And I think we should try and be careful of that somehow, but I'm not super hopeful. So you're saying not only to look at the big numbers, but to be more uh, delicate and understand that some people will earn and some people will lose. Thank yes. you, Edwin. Hi, everybody. Edwin K. Morris here. My opinion is this, is that the evolution of how work is done will continue to shift. Knowledge will still have a value. And how we interact with digital assistance and digital guidance will continue to adapt. And the human framework will never leave that equation. The, the how and why we interact with AI will continually change 
And I think what will happen is that we will end up with a drive through convenience store mentality of getting things done that will empower all, just in case, uh, for an example, would be Office 365 and the AI that's already driving small business to be more capable because now they can rely on AI to help the business operation without uh, much to do, you know, without much back end science on the small user. They just get the benefit. So I think the constant parade of changes is never ending. I'm in. I'm in. Okay. Now, uh, I I, I won't repeat what you said, Edwin, but I, I, I love one sentence. I love them all, but I want to repeat one sentence that knowledge will still be the value. So let's see how it uh, works. And I want to take the things you said and maybe restructure them. So first of all, I'll start from the end. I'm no prophet. I, not, I cannot really predict the future. And those who tried, See, sit in uh, some silly places. But I do, do want to speak about the AI effects on the workforce, about the areas in which human will rule, because we want to understand where will we rule and where will the machine rule. And after, to ask ourselves, how should we prepare ourselves to this future? So, if I look at the effects themselves on the workforce, without going into the small details, uh, I want to, to, uh, to continue what was already said by one or two of you, that there is a threat of losing jobs and we will lose jobs. But the history taught us that even though we are working on automation, hardware or software for already 100 years, and even more from Ford, I think that's the first rapid uh, innovation. So even though it's almost a, a, a 100 years, we can still say that even though the workforce only got greater and greater, bigger and bigger, it didn't shrink really. Now, up till now, folk, workforce did not decline it just changed. And I want to give you an example. 40 years ago, I go into my bank. It didn't look like that really. It looked a bit, it, it, it thought it was a modern bank. And I remember myself entering the branch, entering the office and asking the clerk if he can please tell me how much money do I have in my account? Some of you were uh, born already 40 years ago, right? Some of you like me had already a bank account. So this guy says, okay, tell me your account number. And he takes a pen and he takes a piece of paper and he writes my number and he tears off the piece of paper and put, takes it in his hand and he says one minute and takes, you know, a, a, a bite from his sandwich. And he gets up and he goes to the end of the room of the hall. And at the end of the big room, there's, there are long tables. And on these tables, these, uh, there are cards. And on each card, there are details of bank account uh, details of different people. And he goes and he looks in these cards, one after the other, say, ha, oh, okay. And he takes something and he sticks it in the right place. And he takes out my card and he takes the pencil and he writes down the amount. And then he puts it back and he comes back to me, sits down and gives me the number. Does this scenario send, uh, sound familiar to some of us? I think that I'm not the only one that got such bank services. Now, if I look today at the same bank and I'll ask myself, did the workforce decline? Did it shrink? The answer will be, of course not. 
Do we not have clerks in our, uh, uh, in our offices, in our branches, in our uh, city banks? Of course we have. But two things happened. A, or a few things happened. A, there are much more people in IT, much more people in headquarters, much more people at the back office than in the front office. That is one thing. So the mixture, the blend changed. And that will happen to us again, because I'm speaking about the history, but I'm learning from the history towards the future. And the second thing is that only, not only the roles have changed, but also the specific clerk with the same name that gave me service 40 years ago, and maybe is still sitting there, is yet giving for a service to the people. But now, instead of getting up and going to the table and checking the numbers and putting the card back, instead he opens his, uh, his computer and he checks and gives me an answer in a second. So what does he do the rest of the time? It's not that we sh shrink so much. He can say, he can give me much more details. He can answer much more questions. He can do many other things, proactive sales. So the same people, we upskilled them, we uplifted their role, they uplifted their job. And today the value proposition for the bank got greater and greater. So remember this sentence, our value proposition to our organizations in the future will get greater and greater the more AI, the more robotics, the more computerization we have. Limoy? Yes. Can, can I um, kind of jump in on this too? Because sometimes I always look at the total cost of it. And with um, you know technology and growth, you're, you're going to see new things. You're going to see new jobs come up, or, or you're going to see jobs displaced. And like what you've talked about with the teller um, is absolutely probably great in the direction that we're going. But my concern is our preparedness to move into those right. next jobs because of the displacement. Because okay. you think about it, huh? You, you think about it like we're still suffering from not including the librarian in when we started doing the taxonomies who were experts in it. We're still suffering for not including the secretary and the administrative person who was excellent at establishing file structures. And we didn't leverage those functionalities. So our functionalities don't really change. It's just that we notice the automation pieces that are supposed to improve and add value. But when you look at something like the bank, um, you know, the teller was there and it was great and they decided to automate. So they went with the ATM. And I'm still not certain that the ATM was a successful model because what they did was the total cost. Like you said, they forgot that IT brings in a different skill set. And they then had to maintain the ATM. And unfortunately, they still kept the teller. So the cost actually went up. So I'm not totally certain of the value added there. I see the, the improved functionality for the individual, but I also see the additional cost for the, uh, for the clients and the users. Okay. okay, so I have three parts for the, uh, to this lesson. The third part is how shall we prepare ourselves? Okay. We'll get to there. Okay. You are absolutely, I, I absolutely agree with you that we can un not prepare ourselves or prepare ourselves in an improper way and we won't be on, this, uh, right, uh, uh, on the right way, uh, on the right uh, route. But there are things that we can do and it's not easy and they are questionable. And I'll go into them one after one. Yes, but what we saw that happened in the past 10, 100 years is that people work less hours. If we look 50 years ago, we had people that worked from eight to eight. Now today we can work from eight to four or eight to five or sometimes work even less. So we may see that in the future, we work only four days a week or we work less hours a day and we change our life work balance. That may be the fact that we say that the first uh, workforce will not decline. Maybe there will be some jobs that we will lose 
and we would have to prepare ourselves, but maybe the, the work itself will shrink and we will let work less hours, spe generally speaking. And that's our good, that's, these are good news. And I think that we forget them when we speak about the new ideas and the new automation. So let's go to the second part. So if we say that probably we won't, that the workforce itself will not shrink. However, the jobs will change. The, the interesting questions, the interesting question is where will we as human beings uh, rule? You see, the third part is how should we prepare ourselves, Annie? I prepared myself to this question. So AI will be superior on some tasks. Okay. But the question is not where AI will be superior, where will be we as human beings be superior? So I tried thinking about some typical issues. And I heard so many times that, oh, when it comes to decision-making, we need ourselves, we need the human beings. And as uh, Corey already said today, no, wrong answer. People will not automatically rule on decision-making. We see today two typecasts of decision-making by AI, there are much more. One, real-time decision-making. This is an example of hotels today AI updates the rates of the cost of a hotel room according to so many parameters, finding the optimal, co uh, the optimal um, fee so the uh, hotel will earn the most. So there will be hours in the day that will be more, there will be hours of the day that will be less, there will be uh, hours in the day that you cannot even order a hotel for one day, but you have to order at least two nights, et cetera. So we started doing it manually a few uh, years ago, but now the AI is getting, uh, is ruling it. And we see that real, uh, real time decisions are ruled by AI. When we go to the complicated decisions, like, uh, taking decisions in a courtroom, we also there, I, I gave two very, uh, very different sub uh, typecasts. We can see also there that AI is starting to rule. In uh, many countries, I see that there are already pilots and maybe some are already even have past the pilot stage where AI recommends or even decides on small issues, who is to win? Should someone get insurance or shouldn't he get insurance? Is A correct, is A to win or B to win? Etc. Etc. I found, or in Croatia we found uh, examples, we found examples in the national security, whether to pay people or not. And in more and more places, we see that also in complicated issues of decision-making AI rules. So we take decision making and say, okay, five years ago, maybe we thought that AI cannot rule there, but it's already capable. And we go to image recognition and many years they said, oh, that's so complicated. Only people can be so, uh, understand, but we already know this. Uh, someone knows who, whose picture is this? Who came up with the idea of showing a terrier a dog? This is Google. Uh, this is the um, uh, case study by which Google tests itself. Is it a mop or is it a dog? And the interesting thing is not if the uh, machine makes mistake. What's the interesting question? If the human makes the mistake. Again, Kari, please if the human actually makes the mistake instead of the machine. Okay, I want to be a bit more delicate. The question is, what is the uh, level, what is the rank of mistakes or what is the rate of mistakes? 
how many mistakes do people do and how many mistakes do computers do? And what we can see here is a very famous graph showing that in, human, in image recognition, the error rate of mistakes is human error is 5%. And what we can see, that's the red line. People who don't change. We still, in general, looking at us as a population, not speaking about a specific individual, we have 5%, uh, that's the level of our mistakes. If we look at the AI machines, the rank of mistake in image recognition goes down and down. And in 2015, that is the important year, the machine turned better than human beings. So now it's even getting better. I want you to remember this because when we speak about driving and in so many countries and states, we say, okay, we cannot let the car really drive because maybe it will have an accident and kill someone. The error level of cars, of AI ruled cars is less, is lower than our level of mistakes. The reason is different why we don't let them uh, drive yet. So we go to a third place where we thought that people will rule. Text understanding, we are KM people. And we know that AI has so much to offer where we cannot rule no more. Turning unstructured questions and sentences to uh, structured queries turning uh, or choosing from a bunch of documents, the documents that are more important, uh, um, suggesting how a folder, how a drive should be organized with categories and subcategories, or to tagging, uh, summarizing documents, preparing knowledge graphs, and it can go on and on and on. Again, here, we do not we cannot say that we as human beings rule the discipline. So we have to look for other topics. Until two years ago, we thought that people will turn and get take more tasks that have to do with emotions. We still sometimes believe so. But what we are starting to see is that the machine is starting to rule also here. I'm saying starting because I believe that within five years, probably it will rule, but now it's starting. I want to give two examples. The first example is this lady, I don't remember her name. Uh, Bernard Ma uh, interviewed her, so you can see them together here. And she analyzed the emotions that we can see on people's faces. Now, if I look at Edwin and I'm saying, wow, Edwin, Edwin is smiling, or at least his picture is smiling. And I can say that John Lewis is very serious. And I can go and continue on and on. What she did, this lady, she took our face and she divided it and she found that there are 32 different types of muscles in our face. We have muscles around our mouth and around our eyes and in different areas in our face. And if you map these muscles and you start showing the machine, okay, this is a happy person, this is a happy person, this is a happy person. This is someone joke, uh, uh, laughing, 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 etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What we do intuitively, the machine analyzes and finds what muscles are operated in each action. And the bottom line is that if we're speaking about emotions or, or face emotions, AI is already better than people. I'm stopping here, I'm pausing because it's really uh, something new or something that is really, I think that it's innovative. 
I see that there are some uh, um, chats. Is there anything, Annie, that should I stop before I go on uh, with the, uh, with speaking about emotions? Is there something should I, that should I? Uh, no, there's, there's nothing in the chat really, just um, conversation, but nothing uh, related to. Okay, so I want to know to go to uh, another example. And we see her only uh, microphone or speaker, but this is the name of an application, a robot named LEQ. And this LEQ is one of many applications. Now you can see it, I'm sorry. You should have told me that I'm speaking. I saw that my uh, slide that's one, one step further. And LEQ is a robot for the elder age. And LEQ sits in the living room and you can find the LEQ uh, video. And she-, it's, it's she it, to it, move forward, um, Maria, it's on emotions. Is your slide supposed to be on emotions? Yes. Okay. I'm showing you the LEQ robot. So many years we thought that robots are supposed to look like people, but they're not supposed to look like people. And if you will, uh, if you will uh, click the video that I have here, I'm not clicking it now on lesson, but you can, you can click it when you go to the PDF later on. If you click the video, also this one is clickable. Uh, so you can see the full details. If you go to the to the uh, uh, to, to see the uh, video of this LEQ, you can see that we have. You know what? Let's try. Um, I'm not sure that we can. Uh, I didn't share my um, voice, so we will try. Uh, we'll see if we do it fast, and we can share it with our voice. So um, here we are. LEQ. Okay, we have here LEQ. LEQ is a friendly looking, amazing Alexa for the elderly. And I'll show you an only. Um, we, don't, we don't see it, Maria. Yeah. You don't see it? LEQ reminds me of oh, no, my meds, arranges rides for me. She even reminds me of all my appointments. Mary, don't forget bridge with the Golden Girls at 1 p.m. Would you like to practice? Oh, I don't need to practice. I didn't catch that. Do you want to play bridge or not? Oh, fine. Let's play. We, we can see the video, Moria. You can hear or you can see? I, I, I can hear it. Mary, but, you um, wanted to Skype with Liz. Would you like to do that now? Oh, sure, that sounds great. Well, you have only the audio, not the video. Hey, honey. Hi, Mom. Okay. Hey, uh, I just know. Yeah. I'm stopping. Stopping. Stop Would you like to respond to Meg? Did you hear me? Did you hear it? Did you see it? Yeah, we're hearing it, but we're not seeing it. There's, okay. Um, so. You have to, uh, go to another screen when you're using it. I know, no, I'm not certain with Zoom. Or never mind, or... never mind. You understand the idea. It plays bridge with you. It reminds you to go to the uh, to the club. It, it reminds you to practice. If you don't want to practice, it pushes you a bit in, in order uh, so you practice, uh, so you will uh, accept and you will agree and stop, uh, um, uh, stop, uh, practicing, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very nice and very gentle and very friendly. So really you have, and, and you can see it by yourselves later on because it's really a movie that each one and one of us can say, there are more and more robots that help the elderly. There are in many ways. And we understand that probably instead of having someone bathing us, speaking with us, um, walking with us, reminding us, uh, playing with us, maybe the robot will do it in even a more friendly and attentive way than we do. Now, I'll go back to the presentation and let's see if you can see my screen. Just a minute. Do you see my screen of emotions? Um. No, we see the your... notes. You see the notes yeah. now? Yeah. Okay, so let's retry. It's not that complicated. 
uh, screen number two. Can you see my screen now? Oh, we yes. can. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's probably was the problem uh, uh, five minutes ago that you saw the notes instead of seeing and uh, you heard it. Uh, okay, I found the problem. Lessons learned. So we go to the next area, creativity. But here we don't have to take too much time. We had a full uh, hour with uh, Vincent, reminding us that, or telling us or sharing with us the information that robots can also uh, not only play music, but all, also it can create music, can draw paintings. I will remind us how it is done, how it is performed, because it's something that's connected to all these question areas. Why can AI do them? The reason is that it really does not know what is a creative drawing or a nice drawing. But what it does is it paints a lot of drawings, a lot of drawings, let's say. I'll be very simplified. And then it compares them to creative, nice pictures that we thought are nice drawings. And it chooses among the 10,000, 100,000 million drawings, those that are for, uh, very close or very uh, resemble the creative drawings that we found very special. And it throws all the rest. And we are left with the, those who look so good. And we say to ourselves, wow, the computer does something special. We can tell ourselves, no, the computer only took a whole bunch and threw the unsuccessful uh, ones. But that's also what we do when we create new things. There are very few people that start and have the answer. Even the more talented one, once try and try again and try again and again until they find good. A, a good painting, a good a tune, a, 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 a very special music, etc. So maybe we are more similar to machines than we even thought. So in what tasks are human beings yet superior? Not creativity, not decision-making, not um, emotions. What, yes? Okay, I'll give a bunch. Uh, when we are speaking about new directions, disruption, AI does not rule yet. I don't know what will happen in 10 years. It's not there, not at all. When it's speaking about ethics, about policies, AI has no answer to give us. It's we, the people. When we're speaking about complex tasks, here, we are starting to see that, for example, with cars, that AI can handle a complex task, but that is less than 1% or if, uh, than uh, the, the complex tasks. In the majority of the cases, AI knows to handle a well-defined task. It doesn't know how to handle too many tasks and it doesn't know how to connect them. We have a, if anywhere we have nonlinear tasks, we have a problem with AI finding the answer. When we have tasks that were not covered by AI because they are, not because AI cannot do them, but we decided not to do them because it's not cost effective, because it's unique, because it's um, too complicated to understand uh, 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 or we don't have enough data, so we cannot uh, really um, crack it down and find the problem. In these areas, AI yet cannot help us. We also have to remember that AI has to be supervised. I want to remind us all, the machine starts working. The AI starts giving the rules, uh, the, the uh, decisions on some a trials, in a justice trials. We have to supervise it to be sure that it's not making mistakes. Why do we have to supervise it? It's not trivial because in regular software, if you don't make changes, the software that worked yesterday 
is supposed to work also tomorrow. In AI machine, la uh, uh, machine learning uh, co uh, computing, the case is different. Why is the case different? Anyone? The case is different because the logic I'm reminding us all in machine learning is not in the algorithm. The algorithm hasn't changed, but the, uh, the wisdom is not in the algorithm. The wisdom is in four letter word, our beloved four letter word in the data. And the data is changing all the time. So even though it's not good enough only to train the data and to train the machine and train and train more until it's okay. Also after it's okay, we have to supervise it. And that will be something that we people are going to be doing. And we have to deal with new professions that pop up, that grow, that start because we have AI. All kinds of new professions. Supervising AI is only one of them. So these are only a handful of places where AI is going to rule. But I think that the most important question is, how can we prepare ourselves to the future? Because the most uh, complicated question, uh, the most known thing is that everything is unknown. And if I'm looking at where AI is ruling today, the examples I showed five years ago or three years ago, part of them, or two years ago, part of them, if I would ask people, they say, no, these are areas where people will rule. So how can we prepare ourselves for the unknown? And I want to suggest answers on three levels. How can we prepare ourselves as a society? How can we prepare ourselves or how should we prepare ourselves as organizations? And how should we prepare ourselves as individuals? So let's start with society. What should society, how should society prepare itself in what terms, in what aspects? Maybe someone's answering on the chat. Not yet, okay. So first of all, ethics. We, as a society, have to put a lot of effort in the existing and in the future questions of AI, uh, uh, work, uh, of AI work for cars, for uh, decision-making in trials, for many scenarios where AI will work. So it's a lot of work out there. And this is something that we have to prepare ourselves. I would say that we had to start preparing ourselves five years ago and we started preparing ourselves, but I'm not sure that we did it fast enough and with enough resources, we have to work much harder and work on the eth ethics problems. And it's not all the ethics challenges. We have to uh, prepare and define uh, 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 policies. I see I have here an eye that shouldn't be here. Uh, we have to prepare and we have to put efforts in designing new policies where we want machines, where we want people. Maybe we will decide that for the elderly, we want machines only in specific things, not because AI cannot do it. We want a uh, uh, we, maybe we want a human touch in some places. So it's not only questions of ethics, but it's questions of policies. What do we, how do we want to educate our next generation? How, let's say that tomorrow the robots teach us better. Do we want only robots to teach the children? Where do we want people to teach them? Where is it okay that robots will teach them if they do a better job? So these are questions not only where AI can work, but where we want it to work and where we do not want it to work too much. And of course, we have to work on the educational level of our next generation and our current generation. And it's not only a job of the organizations, it starts with the governments. 
It starts with the countries. They have to start at the ministries of education and the universities and um, uh, the ministries of um, uh, workforce. They all have to ask themselves, how do they educate the various ages, people in the, in, in the, the, in the different people in populations in different uh, ages. So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves and prepare ourselves as society. It's not zero one. It's not that we did not start, but I believe that we did very little up till now. We have to prepare ourselves in the level of organizations. And if some of you have read the materials I've sent you, there's a debate because the question if to prepare ourselves or not to prepare for ourselves if everything is unknown or a lot is unknown, is not one that is agreed. It not, it's not settled down and we don't have one answer. But I'll tell you what I think. I think that we have to teach ourselves how to learn all the time because our roles will be changing, our jobs will be changing, our tasks will be changing. So we have to learn to learn better. We know how to learn, but we never learned how to learn. And we have to put much more efforts in the organizations. We can't wait only for the Ministry of Education, for the, gov for the government. We have to teach our employees how to, learn, how to learn how to learn. We have to teach them better critical thinking. It's important for supervising the machine, but not only for there. We have to give them digital orientation. I want to tell you that 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we thought that a lot of the workforce would not be equipped for the new jobs because they are not skilled enough. But even if we take people that did not finish eight years uh, of school, we yet know that today, a lot of them know to use uh, computers, to use Facebook, to use social networks, etc. So organizations have to look and see how they educate not only the, 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 the best people, not only the, talent, the most talented people, but how do they educate also the low levels, all levels. Each one and one, they give them a bit more. They take them up in their vector. Being more digital, understanding more in data, and learning teamwork. These are the general skills that I combined that I think that are most important for organizations in order to prepare themselves to shifting and changing the roles, the tasks, the jobs again, 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 and again, and again. That is general education. A, B, organizations have to upskill. It's not only a solution to buy in some data analysts, to buy in AI algorithm, uh, algorithmic uh, experts. There are not enough of these people in the globe. And we cannot wait until they will learn in the university or learn in all kinds of outside courses and come in three years because in three years we will need more and more. So what we find is that we also use the experts, but we also have to upskill our current employees, our current workforce, when we see the opportunities that are arriving and that are entering our organizations. And the third thing, so A, general education to all, so also the one who is cleaning the toilet can tomorrow do something with a computer, simple, easy, but can also help there. A, B, upskilling everyone. And three, and I think that that is the most important thing. And I'm sending you an additional reading to read Suskin's work, job re-engineering. Read my lips, job re-engineering. We are speaking about taking every, each job and each role and breaking it out into pieces and saying, here we need the uh, expert, 
but it's only 20% of his job. 80% this and this and this can be about, uh, uh, performed by uh, uh, someone who is not an expert or novice. And these and these and these can be uh, 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 performed by people who don't even have any specific skills in the uh, in the specific task, but can only um, uh, do routine work. And this and this and this can be by the public. And this and this and this by the machine. So it's not only that jobs will change, we have to take the changing jobs and we have to proactively, if we want to prepare ourselves best, proactively break them down into pieces and re-engineer them, asking which piece and part will be performed by uh, which people. And then we can utilize our workforce that was educated and upskilled. Pause. I want to end because I promised uh, art five minutes. How can we prepare ourselves as individuals? All the time, read, 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 learn, listen to videos, read in uh, materials, all the time be prepared, not only learn to learn, but also read everything or listen to everything that we can. B, seek for opportunities. The minute we see an opportunity in our organization, jump on it. We, not, we don't want to wait for the organization to call us. We want to be there first. And see, we have to dare. If we will not dare, we will, it's not that our job will not change, but we will be last in the row. And we want to be first in the row. So what I'm saying is that I believe that is a, in a brighter, smarter future where most of us, or even all of us, if we will work correct in the right path, if we will prepare ourselves, if our organizations will prepare themselves, if our societies will prepare themselves, we will all win. It won't be a lose-win uh, situation, it will be a win-win situation. And the computers, the robots will be working and they won't even be bothered too much. They won't even be sad that they're taking out our jobs. So we also have to be happy. So that's it for now. And I'll let Art uh, jo uh, say a few words about the uh, American volunteers. And if we have still time, we'll go back and hear your thoughts again. Oh, that's very, very, yeah, okay, very excellent, uh, Maria, and yes, we should all be very excited about the future, it, it is everything, I think it's a perfect storm coming together, as long as we take advantage of it, so the wonderful presentation and, and uh, very insightful, thank you. Um, yeah, so wanted to, to, let me share my screen, um, to bring you up to date on the amazing work that our volunteer force is doing, and we've kind of been making things up as we go along, and I'll, I'll share with you what we have discovered. So give me a second here, and we'll start. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it, but um, Corey, uh, yeah, Corey Cannon, um, rose, rose to the occasion when we were talking first meeting with our volunteer, he came up with the idea, he said, you know, I have a lot of Frank Calabrese's, Dr. Calabrese's files that uh, he shared with his students uh, over the years. And he's uh, got quite uh, a library. No one, so uh, 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 too many people don't know who Frank was. Oh, really? Okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank Calabrese, he was one of the co-founders of KM Global Network and the, the managing director of our institute in the US, uh, IIKI. And he is beloved by everyone. And he just, all he, he his whole and life, he, he just wait. wanted to help, help people and mentor. And, yeah, and, and he, he was everybody's mentor. <laughs> and he willingly, he was a perfect example of knowledge sharing. He continually shared knowledge, everything he knew, everything he found somebody, he would email people. So um, thankfully, uh, Corey had uh, accumulated all of the stuff that the files that uh, Frank Calabrese was sharing. And you see this big long list and there are over 200 of them. And so 
This is a good knowledge project. You start with a big pile of, of files, totally random. Corey went and began to look at them. He opened each one and then began to establish naming conventions. And he's named oh, well over a hundred of those uh, files already based on you know, what, what the main topic might be. But so we have, you start with random files, hundreds of files. You then give them each a naming convention. Now, what do you do with them? Well, our first thought was, well, we have some volunteers. Let's build a folksonomy, right? We know that we, we know as K Embers, we know how to build a folksonomy. But um, here, ah, I'm trying to. Okay, uh, we use something called the Echo Knowledge Base, which is a plugin for WordPress. So here's what we did. Um, here's our IIKI website, and you see what we've built here. Something called the IIKI knowledge preservation library and so i'm going to click on that and this is what we built using the plugin and so you see here a collection of the wisdom of dr frank calabrese uh, and, and corey is is our editor of that knowledge base and we didn't as it turns out we didn't need to do a folksonomy we thought that was going to be a lot of work but oh we forgot frank for those of you who do know him uh, for his doctoral dissertation uh, about 20 years ago, he did the first, that's right, he did the first doctorate in KM at the George Washington University, and here's what he did. Um, he put together this four-pillar model for knowledge management, leadership, organization, technology, and learning, along with external environmental in influences and disciplines, which feed those four pillars. So we said, wow, you know, the taxonomy is already built. We don't need to, to do this. So, that, so that, was the, that was the good news. Um, so then we just basically took Frank's model and built that out. And we, again, we did this simply with the WordPress plugin. It is free. So we take his leadership, organization, technology, and a, a lovingly, uh, for those of you, again, who remember Frank, his favorite saying was, ask not what technology can do for you, ask what technology can do to you. And he kept saying that over and over again. So he broke out each of his pillars, as well as the environmental and multiple disciplines. And now we're beginning to take these files and with the help of our volunteers, begin to populate these areas. So for instance, under leadership, okay, um, the first pillar, do you value your knowledge? Leadership and the four pillar model is, a, is one of the articles in Frank's collection. And there you see Frank's article, okay? The other interesting thing is, oh, um, see, it's not allowing me to click. All right, there, um, boom, let me go back. So that's the, so you see, we populate this knowledge base with all of Frank's articles and anybody's articles for that matter. Um, so right away, as soon as Dr. Alex Bennett, and she's also on the faculty of Bangkok University, some of you may know her, she heads up the Mountain Quest Institute and has amassed a huge collection of, of knowledge. In this, and so they have offered to to post in our in this knowledge base all of the knowledge that they have published and put together. And you see, so they've got learning loops, they've got something called the social change journey, and they've got an entire research portfolio. So again, let me show you. We didn't need to do any folksonomy or any other thing with that. Here is their, they already have built their taxonomy for based around an intelligent, complex, adaptive, system okay that's their work and so yeah we basically took that and now we've got a second knowledge base so for instance we can now link and see we can link frank calabrese's leadership with the mountain quests uh, views on leadership and their different aspects uh for and they do frank did systems engineering and so did uh let's see somewhere in here uh these guys have got systems where is systems yeah there is systems right there so here's the idea we go back to our iiki please shrink this um <laughs> i'm trying to get out of this i can't click my my tab because of this darned uh 
Oh, I know what I can do. I can move it, get it out of the way. Thank you. Um, so let me go back to our home page. And you see here we have we we have our own IIKI brain trust, okay, with all the people and everybody. There's Vincent is in there. There's there's Dr. Alex Bennett who I mentioned. Annie, or, you know, everybody's there, and everybody has their own body of knowledge, their body of work. So that is a huge resource that we can tap. But not only that. Now, what about KM Global Network? We've got an entire network of resources, KM resources, people knowledgeable and in different areas. No one of us is doing everything. So, so the idea, uh, and I think, you know, Moria, you kind of uh, planted the seed of this when I first talked to you about this, is uh, if any of our remaining KM volunteers uh, who still haven't, uh, uh, haven't uh, contributed anything yet, this might be something good. Start thinking about and working on how can we take what we've done here just within our own institute with just two, two bodies of knowledge, how can we expand that out to the whole global KM global network? Uh, if we do that, can you imagine the connections we could make? And uh, when we and also when we first built this, Corey, this is one of his favorite sayings. That, that he tells all everybody that he works with, when it's lost, it's gone forever. And that's particularly with Frank who passed away and we're very <laughs> lucky that uh, Corey was able to accumulate all this knowledge. And that's true for all of us. You know, we all have an expiration date, um, but we don't need to wait till then. Let's build our knowledge out using a very simple, cheap tool. It's not very sophisticated. We, it's not like the tools we saw in our vendor demonstrations. I wanted to build a knowledge graph of this where we could navigate, uh, but that takes a lot of work. But heck, let's just start what we're doing very simple with the free tool that we have. And this gets us down the road of collecting and preserving our knowledge, and then we can continue to add to it as well. Of course, it's open for everyone that, once, uh, once it's ready. Yes. So any thoughts on that anybody has? Great. Thank you for hey. the hard work. Hey, Art, nice. to let you know, there's still about another 250 articles I got to go through and name yet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, okay. So maybe we, we, we should, um, you know, try to turn loose and see if we can grab some um, freeware or uh, open source uh, text analytics tools and maybe cut them loose on that. Um, you know, cause yeah, it, it is, we're going through this manually right now. Uh, although those tools that we saw from our vendors, we've used them, but they're, they're very expensive. We don't have access to them without a license. Um, but yeah, but you, you can appreciate this. But everybody, why, why not? Why don't any of us, if, if you have your own uh, website, your own Word, WordPress site, pick up this again, here it is. It's called the Echo Plugin Knowledge Base. And you see it's, it works just like every other WordPress uh, interface. Okay, there they all are. Uh, and you can build your own knowledge base and, and categorize it. You build up, you, you put together these, you, your taxonomy, you use to create these different categories and subcategories and subtopics and boom. Oh, by the way, one more thing, uh, you can search. So you see previous search here, uh, curry. So they say, where in this knowledge base can I find something about curry? And you'll never believe where in, in Frank's collection. Oh, wow, well, come on, please try again later, not found. No way, I know there's curry in here because I, I did it when I, Re dry rehearse this. All right, well, anyway, one of Frank's students did a project on, you know, they were doing knowledge transfer where one person transfers knowledge to another. And so one of his students was, I think a Thai student. Yeah, of course he was teaching in Thailand that let me share my knowledge and secrets with you of how to cook curry. <laughs> so that's in this knowledge base, but I don't know why the uh, search engine is not doing it. Um, but anyway, that's another example. You, this, there's a search tool here, and when it works, you can you know put in your keyword and access all of the articles having to do with that keyword.
Thank you, Art. Great. And thank you, Corey, for the great work and other volunteers that are also out there. So I think that if I want to summarize what we spoke about today, I think that um, Edwin put it in the best words. Knowledge will be the value. It was the value yesterday. It is the value today and will be the value tomorrow. That's why we need your treasure art. That's, that's why we need uh, Frank's treasure. That's why we need our jobs and we have to continue on learning, upskilling ourselves, preparing ourselves to a brighter and smarter future. So uh, dear gu uh, guys, dear ladies, uh, something like, I got nearly 20 uh, presentations up till now. Please send me your presentations. And next week, you are speaking and we will be all listening. Thank you and see you again next week. We will really miss you after next week. I'm already starting to be sad. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice picture. Art, great work. Yes, like I said, um, and thanks to Corey for doing it. It was his idea. I mean, we were just looking around for things to do. We're saying, well, maybe we can create some content. And the, he came up with that. And, and we ran with it. And the more we do it, the more excited we get. And you see there, you can just expand this knowledge, keep expanding it and add to it. And, and it's there now. And, and the other thing that, that amazed us was, yeah, it does take a lot of labor. <laughs> it's labor intensive if you don't have tools like Megaputer. Um, but uh, still, it's, it's, uh, it's very gratifying. And yet yeah, you're, you're now preserving knowledge. But the tool itself is, like I said, a, a free plugin for WordPress. So really, no, I guess another message would be no excuses. If, if an organization still isn't capturing knowledge uh, on a scale like this, I'm sorry, no excuses. The tools are out there and they are free. I, I want to ask, maybe there are some, uh, to some level, uh, to some extent, a free AI tools that can uh, auto tag the articles, the 250 articles and uh, connect them to the folders. There are. Google has one. Um, now, now, again, they, they produce, they do the entity relation extraction, which then you have to go through and say, ah, so this is a topic of interest to me. But it's, it's, it saves you the step of manually. No, I'm, saying, I'm not speaking about preparing the entity extraction, but I'm asking if we have already the, a list of entities that was his taxonomy, what he prepared. And we have the documents. Can it auto tag the individual uh, documents into the right place? Oh uh, no, no, not not. Uh, no yet. free. Not, not no free any, tools for that. I, I have I have not come across any free tools for that. We, wouldn't be hurt. Wouldn't hurt to try and see if we can find some. But right now, off the top of my head, no, I don't know what will do that. Like I said, mm -hmm. the tools can do each step. But to then, as you're saying, to, to take what you have and then scan it and connect them automatically. No, just just give, that. you give it the, the names know. of, and it says, it auto tags. Right. I don't know, that, that should be out there somewhere, you would think, well, maybe we'll give it a search. We'll, we'll, we'll search, see if we can find something. 